Good morning. I just got up. It was a long night last night. Uh, we played our D&D uh, uh, &D 5e Curse of Strahd uh, campaign. That's Big Mike's local game, local group. And so I have missed two sessions. Um, and they meet every other Saturday. So I've missed a month, uh, technically. I haven't seen these, uh, uh, many of these folks in a month. And I reprised my role as Delg Unart, a mountain dwarf sorcerer. And um, uh, I'm still at level 2. I think they're all now at level 3. Uh, I have spent the last two adventures in the infirmary. At the very end of the, the first session I played with Big Mike in this group, um, at the end of, of the night, as the house uh, was crashing in on us, uh, the very last roll of the very, I mean, the very dead last roll of the night as we were escaping this collapsing ruin, this collapsing death house, I failed to save and was killed, or hit zero, I should say. And Shardron, uh, the, the, our dragonborn, uh, dragonborn, oh my gosh, I don't know if I know what his class is. Uh, unbelievable, can't remember. Um, I cannot remember what his class is. Um, anyway, he he went into the wreckage and pulled my 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 basically my lifeless body from the wreckage. And then I unfortunately haven't been able to play in the last two sessions, so they just basically uh, uh, said that I've been in the infirmary uh, in the coma, basically recovering from uh, almost dying. And um, that night, quite a few people almost died. They just. Uh, showed up to play in the other two sessions, so they weren't left in the infirmary. Um, we had our full house. Mike did it again, right? Um, so we had uh, our bard, Graham, half drow, that's Dave. We had uh, um, Agmon, Ag, that's Carl, uh, human male. Uh, by the way, uh, Graham is a, a male uh, bard. Uh, we had um, uh, Megan, that's Carl's wife. Uh, she plays a female human druid um, by the name of uh, Beatrix or Trix we call her and then we had Mike's son his 15 year old son who I've not seen in years uh, he's 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 uh, grown up into a, a, a good looking uh, and a fine a fine young man and uh, he plays a barbarian Toral and he's he's had some interesting uh, dilemmas uh, but this night was made uh, because of because of how well uh, I, I I won't call him Mike Jr. because he's not, and I won't call him Little Mike, but Mike how how Michael played Toro and he played him exactly right, and uh, so this this uh, this young role player, 15 years old, nailed it, and because he nailed it, we ended up in a fight for our lives. Beside him was uh, uh, Ashley. Ashley plays a male tiefling a rogue named Rickvin. And then Connor, uh, you'll have to excuse me, Conrad. Connor, I'm so sorry. Man, I, sh I should know by now. Except, <laughs> uh, except that I thought he said he changed his name. So I, again, maybe he, maybe he made his last name. Anyway, and he plays Shardron, the uh, dragonborn. And I cannot believe I don't know what his class is, um, and he, he's the one that rescued me. And beside him uh, was uh, Dave's son, 15-year-old 15, uh, 15 son, uh, 15, 15 or 16, Sam. And Sam plays, uh, plays the paladin, um, human paladin, who's also fantastic. And so at this table, that's a lot of bodies, and again, Mike right beside me, um, and uh, uh, doing, his, doing his thing, and doing it again Oh, very well. And this time he used a, a just a, a, a mat uh, with white uh, with kind of what, what do you call them? White, uh, white markers. Um, you know, again, this is stuff and terminology way above my head. Even even using a flat mat with white erase markers is above my 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 head. And of course, they have a little figurine for my character. He's a uh, he's a sorcerer, but he's this little dwarf sorcerer, and he looks like he's it looks like he's got this green it's like it's like some kind of green thing coming out of his hand but i tease him looks like it's a big marijuana bush that i'm always waving around because you know we're here in colorado where that's legal so 
anyway, so I wake up in the infirmary with Chardrin sitting by my side, and um, Rickvin is there as well. I think she missed a couple of sessions, so she's kind of behind Ashley. Uh, by the way, her character is Mel Rickvin, so this will be fun to do this without messing up the he-she thing, right? Um, <clears throat> and she, again, is a thief or a rogue. Anyway, uh, the rest of the party had left and traveled farther into, and we are in the land of Barovia, and it is dark, and it is, it is basically, it is under this oppressive cloud of evil, thanks to Strahd. And Strahd is an epic vampire, I suppose, that lives maybe in Castle Ravenloft. I don't know a whole lot about the lore or the canon. I've never bought these books. I've never read these books. So I don't know a whole lot about this. So in a way, for me, it is, it is always fresh to play these, these modules because I don't know much about the D&D canon. I know of the D&D canon, but I've never, part, I've never read it or cared about, uh, what's the other one, Northern Realms. Uh, Sword Coast a little bit, but that's because of the video games, Baldur's Gate's video games that came out. That's how I happen to know about Sword Coast and Baldur's Gate and Loudwater and all that. But aside from that, I never read the novels, and I'm just not, um, I'm just, I just never cared about D&D &D for its lore, its canon, only for the fact that I grew up playing it. So, we're in Barovia, and I wake up in the infirmary, and we realize, and the party again has moved on. And I can't speak to what they had happened to them. You can watch it on Tef's Tavern, Mike's recaps of those last sessions, so you know what's been happening. We decide to go, uh, our, uh, the, uh, we have to make up time, so we decide to go talk to the stable master and get horses. And uh, he says, this old man says, yes, uh, we, have, we have horses left from the last party of adventures that never came back. You know, wink, wink, right? So, um... Immediately we know, mm, okay, other adventures have come through and, and left things because they never survived. And he tells us 50 gold uh, each for horses. And we don't have that. So I ask, is there something cheaper than these fine steeds? And he says, yes, we have old gluey. And I said, fine. Uh, and so before I can just say, well, maybe I've got enough to buy old gluey, the tiefling negotiates for us and gives, uh, gives uh, candles and trades candles and trains a, a Gnostic, is that what it's called? A Gnostic Eye, which is this, this, this device that she found in our first game that I was actually in, where we all thought this Gnostic Eye was dangerous, and we, we played around with that. She gave it to him, and he, and he grabbed it and said, ah, and he bit into it, not realizing it was hard, hard as glass, and uh, he stumbled off saying, the horses are yours, and he stumbled out, you know, teeth broken out and bleeding, but doesn't even phase him, and he stumbles out with this Gnostic Eye. And uh, he gives the two horses to her, and then he he walks uh, old Gluey over to me, which is this old, old horse that kind of lays down, and I'm like, oh, God. So we mount up, and we ride. Meanwhile, uh, while, while we ride off to catch up to our other band of heroes, they have trekked, uh, again, apparently through some village, and they have trekked up around a waterfall, and they're at the top now looking back down on the lake and the waterfall, and they've decided they've missed something. They were supposed to check behind this waterfall. And they decided to come back down to the crossroads and the bridge. And when they reach the bridge, uh, they, they, uh, they talk to uh, a woman with a cart. And so Toral, again, Toral is the barbarian, a male barbarian. Uh, I believe he's male. Uh, again, I missed these sessions. I don't know. And we don't reintroduce. So, But this is Mike's, Big Mike's son. And... and um, so what happened to him was he got punished. He got put on restriction. Um, <laughs> so we won't go into his personal life, but Big Mike had to restrict him. So he missed like three sessions, four sessions, or maybe, okay, two. Uh, but Big Mike threw him in a well. Uh, in, in the session that I joined, uh, we, he, he toppled into this well and fell off. And we all went, oh, I guess I'll never be playing again. Or, well, when Mike brought him back, I guess there are charts or something in Curse of Strahd, when something dies or something is 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 tweaked. Uh, so he sat down with his son before their their the session. His son came back and they rolled these random charts that deformed his barbarian. So now he's this deformed six foot ten, hunched over, deformed beast now, right? And he can't speak. He can't speak common. He's kind of he's lost something like minus three wisdom. So his wisdom is dropped, his intelligence is dropped, he's got one arm longer than the other. So he's like now he's like this mangled with a hunchback, this like protruding tumor out of his back. Anyway, 
he awoke uh, at the hands of these old hags and they have deformed him. They've turned him into this monstrosity. Um, and then in last the session before last, I know this much, they found a woman pushing a cart that was and just dumped this bag out on the road and kept pushing the cart on. And she was swapping pastries for children. Creepy. This was last session. I wasn't involved. Uh, anyway, they open the bag and find it's Toral. It's the six foot ten, and they go, "Oh my God, it's Toral!" They rescue Toral. They try to they try to find the woman, but she vanishes. Meanwhile, everybody in the party now uh, has seen what this. Uh, they don't know who this woman was, but they they're, they're, they assume that she's perpetrated these acts upon Toral, and so they're all now wanting a little revenge. And Toral can't talk, and he's now this he's 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 this mangled character. And again, we're in Barovia, so this kind of stuff happens. It's a very dark, creepy, weird place. Dangerous. Uh, and so they have been, in a way, watching for this old woman pushing this cart around, who apparently th exchanges pastries for people's children. Uh, we don't, I don't know why. I can't remember why. If I may not even have that exactly right. But anyway, again, creepy. And so uh, they go, uh, they come up to the bridge and they see a woman pushing a cart. But she's younger. She's, she's younger than the woman that they had seen, but they approach her um, with Toro. And they're all together in this band, and they approach her, and she speaks to them, and she's got pastries, and she's got a couple of empty bags on her cart. And and they're like, are, you know, um, uh, they're trying to find out, are you, do you know this woman? Are you this woman? What's going on? And Toral responds, um, stricken with fear, because he, he recognizes her voice, and he knows, oh God, this is this is one of the, the hags that did this to me. But he can't speak, and he's stricken with fear. And... Uh, uh, the bard, Graham, Dave, negotiates with Toral, and he sees Toral's reaction as, as the druid tells, uh, 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 points out his reaction, because the bard is the one parlaying with the, the woman with the cart. And when he sees Tor Toral's rea reaction, he immediately draws his rapier, and when he spins around, she vanishes. He leaves her cart, but she's gone. Poof. She's, she's uh, disappeared. And then Toral destroys her cart. He goes into a rage and just mangles her cart, crushes it, leaves Patriarchy spattered about. And that's when we come riding up on this group at the bridge, just around the waterfall. And we all come riding up on our horses. And I described to Mike, Big Mike, that my horse, Old Gluey, starts eating one of these pastries. And he says the pastries smell fantastic. But everybody's debating, well, what's in these pastries? What's going on? And my horse passes out, falls asleep, and he says falls into a deep sleep, hearts beating uh, nice and anyway strong, and, and he's out cold, and I went, okay, I think we know what the pastries do. And uh, we leave my horse there asleep in the middle of the, the bridge, and we all decide to trudge, well, not we all, and they also have, by the way, two NPCs with them, a, a brother and a sister that they have agreed to take to a village called um, Velati, I think that's right, Velati. And um, I have it in my notes, but uh, Velati. Uh, and so they are grilling, they're asking them questions about where are we, you know, what direction is this, where is Velati, do you know anything about this, etc. So they're, they're with this party, and they're, t they're supposed to be escorting them to Velati. That's how they're on this bridge, that's how they're headed where they're headed. So um, uh, we decide, uh, a handful of us decide to uh, go uh, around this waterfall. We realize, okay, there's a cave behind the waterfall. And uh, four of us go in, four, four of them stay back with the NPCs that they're protecting. And uh, it's myself and the Bard and uh, Agmon and um, I believe our Druid uh, are, yeah, are, yeah, all slink in behind this waterfall. I cast light on, on the Bard. Bard has a stick. We cast light on the stick and he leads us into this, into this, uh, and it's just a natural cave. But there is old crates and old storage stuff here, and there's an old skeleton, dead skeleton, and we investigate. And they cut open these sacks of grain, or I should say the bard does cram, and he finds a doll that looks a lot like Agmon. And he gives it to Agmon, and Agmon stuffs it under his coat, and immediately Agmon feels hot and stuffy. And uh, they put together um, uh, that... that this doll is is Agmon. It's like okay, it's like a voodoo doll, right? I had not yet, as a character, grasped it, right? As a, a, a so, 
uh, the bard cut open the other sack and pulled out what looks like Toral used to look like. And now he's mangled. And I looked at that doll and I said, you know, that's Toral. And they're like, oh, okay. And they all look and they say, yeah, I think so. And I said, you know, and so I said, can I identify if this is magic? And can I identify, can I use identify on this? And Mike says, yeah, go ahead. So I do. And I basically identify, okay, these are voodoo dolls. If something happens to these dolls, it's going to adversely affect these two. So we have to protect them. And they're all talking. And again, so the, it's a big table. So everybody's talking and it's crazy. And I said, so we really should secure these somewhere other than in our coat and on our, in our backpack, etc. Because if this something gets, happens to, if they fall and get crushed by, you know, whatever, it's going to cause major harm. And nobody really pays attention. I said, you know, we've got to find something we can put them in. And they're talking. And I said, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to uh, uh, do a, I'm just going to heave this doll out of the waterfall over to Chardon, who's standing on the other side uh, by, the, by the edge of the water. And I made, a, I made an 18 strength roll, and I chuck this doll, this Toral doll, to Shardrin, and Shardrin uh, uh, fails to catch it. He fails his dex, and so does the pallet, and they both fail their dex, and the, and the doll tumbles into the, the water. And then we all see immediately Toral drop to the ground as he's choking, he can't breathe, he's drowning, basically. And they fish him out of the drink, and they shake him off, and Toral recovers. And, I, and uh, they all said, "What, well, dude, what'd you do that for? And I said, I think I made my point, you know, we... We've got to protect these dolls. And Toral took seven points of damage from that, too, by the way. And I said, but I think I made my point. And they were like, okay, cool. So they decided to get the chest off the old cart that, that Toral had destroyed, secure them in that chest, and lock that chest down. And then we, we put the chest on um, uh, one of the horses. Because we had three horses. We, we have my old horse and two other steeds. Uh, Ashley named hers uh, uh, Wind Dancer. I named... Uh, and. Uh, chestnuts, and I have the old, old, old gray mare, basically. And uh, Ashley named hers. Uh, uh, I just said it. Uh, Wind dancer, and Chardrin named his Silver, you know, because he's a chestnut. And I named mine Wind Breaker because I have a feeling it's breaking wind all the time. All right. So anyway, so that's the that's the story of our horses. So anyway, we all bring everything back together. We go back t as a group together, and we realize, okay, we've got to. Uh, head toward uh, uh, um, uh, this village that we're taking these two NPCs to, and they can tell us a little bit about where this windmill is that we're, we're looking for. And they said, oh, that's on the way. Let's go. So we trudge off, and we come, we're going down the road, and we come, we come across a sack of clothes. Uh, the, the bard is leading the way. The bard picks it up, and he opens it up, and it's just common clothes. Can't tell if they're, you know, uh, they are pants and shoes and socks. I mean, there's a whole bundle of common clothes. And they're, they're, he just he drops them back in the road. Well, I pick him up and I say to I say um, uh, to Mike, "What's in this direction?" He says, "It's an open field." I said, "What's in this direction?" Oh, it's a forest. And I said, "Do I see any tracks?" He said, "Yeah, you see what look like giant dog tracks." And we all, you know, uh, they had already uh, kind of assumed werewolf. And I went, "Okay." I said, "Well, it's daytime." And me and Ag Ag says, uh, well, it's daytime. It's got to be a, a poor human now. And I said, well, we don't want to go hoofing off after a werewolf, do we? And Ag says, yeah, but it wouldn't be a werewolf anymore. It's daytime. It's it's probably a poor naked soul out there in the middle of the wilderness. And I went, you know, basically I said, yeah, that's right. Good point. So I took off following the tracks. I just said, you know, that's a great point. I didn't even debate it. I did a my guy thing and I just took off, uh, plodding off into the forest with a sack of clothes. I threw them on my back and I headed off. And they all followed suit. Well, not all of them, but a handful of them followed him behind me. I think Graham and uh, a couple stayed on, uh, stayed there on the edge of the forest where they could kind of watch us as we walked. And Toro will take it up the back, and as we were walking through the forest, some giant shadow of a beast snatched Toro and flung him in and took off with him into the trees. And we all spun around to face this thing, and Graham and everybody witnessed it. We all spun around to face this noise, and this thing, we would kind of go through the bushes, and there's this 12-foot werewolf uh, standing over Toral's body, wounded and battered, um, and they had healed him. By the way, after the after I pitched their his his voodoo doll into the water, they had laid on. I think they they, they did a basic bard heal on him or something. And we end up in a battle with the wolf, and the bard approaches the wolf. He wins initiative, and the bard says to him, uh, "You know, listen." Uh, he tries to talk to the werewolf, and uh, needless to say, uh, the talking to didn't work. <laughs> And we end up in a, in a combat with this wolf. And uh, the wolf on the first round bites the bard. Um, 
uh, claws him and bites him, picks him up in his teeth and flings his lifeless body into the bushes only a few feet from me because I did not get into melee range. And there's Bar, there's there's Graham in one shot's dead body. He's at zero. He's making death throws in one shot. And we're all standing there. We begin to go to battle with this wolf. <clears throat> and I'm using... Actually, I'm not. I think I chose not to attack to, to, to uh, facilitate uh, medicine on Graham's body on my turn. But the paladin races in, and the druid and the bard, who, which are up on the road still, they come sprinting across through the forest because they've seen him get taken. And so everybody's coming running, and the bard ends up in a, in a, in a, a, a actually the, uh, a talking to, basically. And then the bard gets flung into the woods dead. I then start to treat the bard. And the druid and the paladin end up in this, and Rickman hides and gets behind, tries to backstab. Rickman ends up on the back of this wolf, holding on, uh, trying to trying to backstab it, basically. The paladin uh, uh, is, is, is striking smite on its legs. Uh, Chardon, uh, the dragonborn, is coming in. He's spitting acid, and, and he's also attacking the other leg. And they end up in this tight little brawl around this 12-foot werewolf. This, like, there's like four of them piled on top of this werewolf. And I'm standing back helping Graham, uh, resuscitate Graham. Uh, and Agmon is a sniper. Agmon has got this Eldritch Blast, among other things, and he steps back. He can always take a nice, long path, and he can use this Eldritch Blast. And, and uh, uh, before the bard had been um, killed, he had been able to cast uh, Swarm of Daggers, or Cloud of Daggers. Uh, and so that was there, so we kept trying to keep the wolf in that Cloud of Daggers, force it in and out. Not we. I was, again, attending the bard at this point. The bard did manage to do something before he got uh, incapacitated. So they end up in this wrestling match. The the pal As the wolf at one point takes enough damage, it attempts to turn and run. And Toral, uh, who had already clubbed it in the knee, and the paladin, uh, and Chardin, who had clubbed it in the other knee, and the paladin, who had smited it, and it tried to run. And Toral, when it tried to run, he, he nailed it in an opportunity attack and stopped it. Didn't kill it, but stopped it. And the paladin used his war hammer to, to put it in a chokehold and was grappling with it. And uh, uh, um, Rickman then agrees to start tying up its legs. So Rickman grabs out her rope and they're tying its legs and wrestling with it, trying to subdue this thing. And then I, once I realize I've, I have saved Graham, I cast uh, my witch bolt on it. I, I light it up with le electricity while they're wrestling it, or with lightning, I should say. And um, I can't remember who finished it. I believe uh, Chardon did. Uh, so while they were wrestling with it, trying to subdue it, and Rickman was trying to was trying to hog was trying to hog tie it and couldn't get its hands. Uh, they could not. They couldn't restrain its hands to get him tied. And um, Chardon, and I think uh, Toral stepped in and he choked up on his hammer and made it basically brought it and he started hitting it in its head with a hammer. And that's when Chardron stepped up and drove its, its rapier up through the chin, up through the neck, and through the top of the skull, killing it. And right before their eyes, it changed into a tiny little five foot three young woman. And now they're, they're all, they've got this, this, uh, this young woman is laying on this giant paladin's chest. Uh, the ropes have fallen from her feet, and, and the paladin scoots away and gets up, and he... You know, we're, we're all realizing, okay, you know, this is what we'd hoped to find her in this form and re and give her clothes. And unfortunately, we found her in the werewolf form and we couldn't negotiate with it. So uh, what we thought was, and, and at that point I looked at Hagman, I said, I guess we were wrong. And we thought werewolves turned back into humans during the day. And so had we just left her clothes, we could have just kept going. So we got sidetracked uh, and we kept making jokes that these two poor people who at, who, who, who were, were the group is supposed to be escorting to this village, Valuki, Valuka or something. Um, they keep having to stand around by a cart and the horses on the side of the road waiting for us to quit doing our jaunts into the woods or whatever it is. So anyway, uh, the paladin buries her and he says, he says uh, his prayers over her. And then we all pack up and we get back to the road and we, 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 we're heading toward uh, the village. And uh, we, we come to... Uh, 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 the windmill, and we have the deed for the windmill. Rickvin, being the thief that she is, at some point in their adventures, had stolen the deed from a Durst a family called the Durst family, and so she has this deed. She says, "I got the deed. Let's go check it out." And Toral recognizes it. Okay, Toral 
recognizes it. And again, remember, he's almost at this point. He's 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 handicapped, right? He is he is he's been deformed. He's lost some intelligence. He's lost some wisdom. He can't speak, and he's a barbarian. And he just goes into this rage, and he races up, and he's and he hammers on the door, and we all chase him up. And again, Mike. Michael played this great. Michael's fantastic, and so is Sam. I mean, it's wonderful to see a two young men uh, who really do get it. You know, it's really cool. Um, I mean, all the old adults around the table stink, but these two guys are pretty good, right? So anyway, no, everybody's great. Um, so he hammers this door, and while they're arguing about what are we getting, what are we doing, what are we doing, I walk up and I just turn the door knob and push this door open, and we're all like, okay. And then I walk in. I step in and Mike describes this window. It's about a 60 foot room and it's got something's cooking in the middle of it that's, that reeks. And then there's a stove in the back that's going. And there's a cart and there's some things. There's a chicken coop and there's it's stuff hanging from the ceiling, like garlic and stuff. And there's stairs up. And so we all walk in and a, a hag comes down the steps and stops and is talking to um, Chardon. And, uh, and Chardon is attempting to parlay with her and say, well, excuse me, madam, sorry to invade your home, but, I mean, the dragonborn, it should have been the bard or me, I have a 17 charisma persuasion and whatever, but the point is Chardon's doing the talking, and uh, uh, doesn't make any difference because Toral recognizes her as the, as the woman that tortured her and turned him into this beast, and he, he races toward her, and uh, it launches a fight, a fight with three coven, or with a hag, uh, a coven of three, which, and I think maybe at four turns, 24 to 30 seconds, four, half of our party, half of our eight are down. Uh, and, and I mean, it's a great fight. We have this, but it's, I mean, it's like, I think it's four turns. I mean, that's the amazing thing about it. When you stop the track, how long did it take for all this stuff to happen? It takes us an hour to do. It's 30 seconds of, of actual event, which is how it should be. That's that's how fast stuff happens. So when you think about all this stuff, when, you know, so anyway, there's this point. So anyway, um, we're barely affecting these things, and they're casting six-level spells at us, and she shoots something at, at four of them. And I'm the handful of us are on one side of this thing, casting spells and using arrows. The others are tanks that are melee, like Toral and Toral's and hold person. I've been able to hit some saves to avoid them hitting me while I'm using Witch Bolt, and uh, it's just this crazy fight. Meanwhile, we've thrown. Uh, I think I think Eld, uh, the, the Paladin and uh, between Agmon and the Paladin, they end up getting one of the witches into their own oven, uh, as the because the witch went to the oven to let out these two little demons, which I immediately killed uh, with my Witch Bolt. I just I transferred the Witch Bolt to them. But ar I arced it and wiped them out, and they were able to push her into her own oven, and the Paladin had shut and was standing at the oven. She got out and reversed it and flung him into the oven, I think. Arno got out, and another another witch had then came down. He tried to wrestle her in, and she won the wrestle match and threw him into the oven, so the Paladin was being cooked. It was crazy, crazy that uh, the Paladin had kicked over some that boiling, stinky stew all over the place when the fight started. Um, Chardon was turned into a, uh, what are they called, a, a dragon fairy. So he's a dragonborn, and she reduced him into this flying little dragon with little, with little butterfly wings, talking in a high-pitched voice, and he, and he could still spit fire, and he could fly, but that's it. And, I mean, we are, the bottom line is we're going to die. We got, we're getting our arses kicked. I don't, I'm only second level. They're all level three. I have 14 hit points. Uh, she she had already uh, knocked out one of our uh, characters I, that we had to resuscitate. The, the Toral had to resuscitate Toral already once and get him on his feet with some healing. In one shot, she took out four, and my character with uh, 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 charisma of seventeen and a plus five persuasion. Uh, when it came to my turn, I stepped up and said, "This has gone too far. We need to go. We need to talk. We need to talk. This has gone too far." So they've got four dead comrades, all at zero, making death saves. And I decide, Del decides to say, "Listen, this is a mistake. We we brought you your deed. We just came here to bring you your deed to your house." And she looks and she says, oh, how did, did you steal that deed? And I went, well, we got it. We, we're bringing it to you. And she said, from the Durst family or whatever. And, we, and of course, Rick Vince said, yes, yes, I, I brought it from the Durst family. And so we were able to communicate and stop this madness, which, again, started because Toral did all the right things. 
and it was not the my guy syndrome. I mean, the irony was it was exactly spot on. Uh, Mike, as a as a player, had warned us and uh, uh, that his character wanted revenge, and his character was was terrified and maimed by these women. If they ever come across him, he would go into his his rage, his which is a trait that barbarians have. And so we, you know, we knew we were taking a chance. So he didn't do anything, you know, in that in that sense. It was it was actually perfect. It was the kind of it's the kind of role play you want the my guy thing to have happen, right? It's not the conniving character who wants to be the lock picker or wants to steal the diamond because he wants to have some renown or whatever. I mean, this was all legitimate, good role playing. It was perfect. And of course, Delg being, uh, I think I have a 18 or I have a 16 intelligence and a 17 wisdom. You know, I'm thinking, wait, wait, this has gotten way out of hand. We're just bringing you to Deed. I'm able to negotiate and convince them with my persuasion against, uh, I think she made a save versus my persuasion. And we're able to talk to this old woman and her two daughters, this coven. And we're able to convey to her that we are up against Strahd. And she's like, well, I'm no friend of Strahd. Um, I'm not his enemy, but I'm not his friend. And if Strahd happened to get removed, well, it would make my life a lot easier. And she bestowed upon us a sun sword uh, and told us the story of where the sun sword and the legend behind the sun sword, the sword that that's, had, had been used to strike down Strahd's brother or something like that, some some tell. Uh, you know, uh, at this point, D Delg is, you know, thinking he's lucky stars, we aren't all dead. And um, she gives us the sun sword. And uh, we decide, we give her the deed, and we uh, we basically ask if they can, Torl, you may like, because we asked, why did you do this to Torl? Because he's better that way. They thought they were sculpting Torl into this, this beautiful creature. And so, uh, uh, Megan, uh, Beatrix uh, had said to them, but, but Toral doesn't like it. Uh, Toral doesn't want to be this way. And so she was able to convince them to make an effort to change him back. And uh, they said it would take three days. He needs to go uh, upstairs on the slab. You remember the slab, don't you, Toral? And of course, Toral was a painful, miserable experience, but Toral's like, yeah, uh, but I want I want fixed. So um, he goes upstairs, and I, and I volunteer to stay. Toral, you won't be alone. I'll be with you for this three days. <clears throat> and then uh, 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 that's kind of where the session ended. We all we hadn't quite decided if we were all leaving and I was staying or what, but the, 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 that's where the session ended. But another fantastic session. <clears throat> we ended up, um, and Mike made it all basically all up on the fly. From what I understand, I mean, there may, there's a little bit in the books. I think he said we were at uh, this coven windmill was above our above our level. And uh, but aside from that, Mike uh, has been so busy all week and he's been absolutely inundated with work and schedule and stuff that <clears throat> he really couldn't prepare much more. He had to make up a, a lot of it on the fly and he did a great job. And then again, if this is in the, the, the witch coven at the windmill is in there uh, and he used it, but we really shouldn't have been there at that point, but that's okay. It worked out and I thank God. Oh, and they had, by the way, when I stopped them and said, we're, we're here to give you your deed. This wasn't supposed to happen. You have to forgive our, our barbarian friend. He's, he's, you know, he's a bit nuts. Um, they also uh, one of the one of the daughters uh, cast a spell to get them all up and on their feet with with half their hit points or something, so uh, they were all of course up at that point. I think at that uh, we had literally four of our no we had five we had five no we had four down, we had a our dragonborn had turned into a little flying dragon fairy, and then there was me the 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 second level sorcerer, the rogue, and Agmon who's pretty pretty freaking. Amazing. I think he's a he's a sorcerer. I think, um, but Agmon has got some nastiness about his his skills, and he's a sniper. He can do this stuff from 120 feet away. It's pretty cool. Anyway, we survived. Uh, we negotiated our way out of that uh, fiasco. It looks as if they're going to do something, hopefully for Toral. Let's hope they don't make it worse. Um, let's hope he survives it. Uh, meanwhile, we still have to we still have to deliver. Uh, so this whole time, by the way, outside in the rain, are our two NPCs watching our cart and our horses. Uh, and it was lightning and raining, so there was some, uh, so our thief actually went in late because she was worried her horse would get spooked and run away. So our thief didn't even go up to the windmill until she heard the fighting and then she ran up. And again, I think this all happened in maybe, it might have been six turns, so 36 seconds of time. And it's funny because they're all, I think a lot of times people forget that. And so we're at a table after an hour and a half of combat, it's only 36 seconds of time, real time. And a lot of them are like, how can you stop and negotiate with them? I, I, I could get the feeling that some of them are thinking, okay, how can we just stop and negotiate? We've, we've killed two of our little demons. We've wounded them. We've shot them in the head with an arrow. They've, they've knocked out four of our people. 
And I'm like, because it's it's been 36 seconds. That's why. It hasn't been going on for, this has not been a fight for an hour. This has been a fight for 36 seconds. Uh, and sometimes your only recourse is to attempt to negotiate, especially if they're intelligent beings, or they might have things that they'll trade, like, you go do this for me, and I'll let you live, right? She could have held us to a contract. She could have then said, oh, yeah, I'll let you live, but I got some dirty deeds you guys have to do. You know, uh, she could have done that. So, uh, communication, and the bard has always tried to communicate, and he tried to communicate with the werewolf. Didn't work out. Chardon was going to communicate, and Toral, Toral, mad with rage and vengeance, went after her. And so, of course, it's all a misunderstanding at that point. I mean, not for Toral. Toral knows exactly who these women are. They're evil and what they've done to him. But but Toral's not thinking life or death. He's, he's acting appropriately. So that was the perfect example of not my guy. That was the perfect example of brilliant role playing, all motivated properly. Mike as a player had warned us that if he sees these women, he's he's going to he's because he's been tortured and maimed and look at him. I mean, he's, his character has physically changed. His his character sheet, he's lost wisdom, he's down to a negative three wisdom. He's I mean, there are physical manifestations of what they've done to him, and there are character sheet, there are character attribute manifestations of what they've done to him. No question, everything was right about that. And it was perfect. And it made it made the whole night. Mike, Michael playing accurately his character from the get-go. There was a point during the game, I don't know if everybody saw it, but Chardon was trying to communicate rock, paper, scissors to Toral. And I don't think anyone else was watching. I'm on the other side of the table, but I'm watching Chardon and Mike have this perfect role play where where uh, Conrad is trying to teach rock, paper, scissors to Toral. And Toral would pick up a rock and he rock? And he would say, no, rock, paper, scissors. And then he would get him to go rock. And then when he'd come back and say, rock beats paper, he'd go, rock? And it was just, it was, a, it was beautiful. And it's like, this is role playing, right? And again, it's a crazy table. We're in a, there's all kinds of stuff going on, people communicating and talking. And, and so there's moments like that where they're in character having this, this, this amazing conversation. And uh, you know, I don't know if everybody saw it, but it was very cool. And that's one of the reasons. Big tables are great fun, but but there's moments like that that are lost on big tables. And uh, you don't always get to see and hear. I mean, there were times I saw Sam out of the corner of my eye talking in character to Big Mike. He was talking to the hags. He was asking questions. Um, and we were all, for the most part, having our conversations. And, and you're like, wow, here's Sam trying to elicit information from the hags or from one of the NPCs. And none of us are really paying attention. And so those, those are the things that you say, this is great fun. We've had an amazing night. This is four and a half hours of D&D, of, of, of &D, a party kind of, huge party D&D. &D, and that's normal, by the way. Um, but there are these moments where you say, wow, it's, I hate that some people missed Toral and Chardon's. Well, maybe they didn't. Okay, I'm making an assumption here. Maybe everybody saw it and just didn't think it was that cool. But I did. I, and I thought Michael is, is amazing. And uh, everybody there, when they're role-playing, is fantastic. So, point is, it was another brilliant game by Mike. It was great fun. Mike didn't have bells and whistles. I got, I, I actually got to eat three star bursts last night. No, I got, I negotiated with the hags, and I killed their two little minions. I got to eat four star bursts last night. And uh, I, I would have got a fifth, but I gave, I gave the mother hag star burst to Sam. Uh, because Sam cooked her, and so I gave him the I gave him the more I don't remember what her name was Morticia or whatever I gave Morticia to the paladin. So I ate four starbird last night. It's a shame on me. Bad, bad forty seven year old type two diabetic. Right, I had four starbirds so uh, and pizza, you know. But you got you only live once, right? Anyway, everybody out there gaming this weekend, you have brilliant games. Remember, I will be GMing my first time Ubiquity and the Hollow Earth Expedition game for uh, Ivan Mike, 1968, Runeslinger, and he Big Mike here from Tef Tavern. And I believe that will be on my channel. It might be on Tef's Tavern. It might be on Runeslinger. We haven't decided who should host it and what channel it should be on. But stay tuned. We'll figure all that out. And that should be Monday night, 7 p.m., unless we can negotiate it down an hour. I'm trying to work out uh, to get that hour, uh, get an hour back on the front end. So uh, be patient and just sometime in that window, 6 to 7 p.m. Mountain, we'll be starting uh, Hollow Earth. So everybody at the gaming, have great games. Bye.